Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited for today's video because today we are talking pop songs that you didn't know were covers. Or maybe you did. I don't know. But <laughs> I'm mostly going to be focusing on more recent pop releases, so I'm not going to be doing the ones that everybody knows, like Whitney Houston's cover of I Will Always Love You. But of course, that definitely means that some of the songs that were covered will likely be older songs or songs from decades ago, but the artists put their sort of modern pop spin on it. Or in some cases, they kind of just left it the same as the original, but of course, put their vocals on it. And you guys already know the drill. I can't play the songs in the video because of copyright, but I will link all the original versions of the songs that were covered in the description of this video. So no point of wasting any more time. Let's go ahead and get into it. Cinderella is one of the most memorable songs from the first Cheetah Girls movie. In it, the four girls sing about their independence and how they don't need a man's help to make their dreams come true. Cinderella was released as the first single from the movie's soundtrack, which came out in 2003. But the Cheetah Girls actually weren't the first to sing this girl power anthem. A few other girl groups have recorded the song. Cinderella was first recorded in 2000 by a girl group called I-5. Ironically, they were created to rival groups like 3LW, two members of which ended up being in the Cheetah Girls. I-5, the I standing for international, was an American girl group formed in 2000 with each member representing a different nationality. The group was composed of members from the Philippines, the United Kingdom, Mexico, Israel, and the United States. I-5 was very short-lived and they only made one album together. The album was poorly promoted and their label, Giant Records, was absorbed by Warner Brothers soon after. The I-5 members weren't offered a new contract. They tried to find another record label but were unable to, and the group disbanded in 2001 after only a year together. I-5 did get to do some cool things in their short tenure though, like opening for Britney Spears and performing at Nickelodeon's All That Tour. Cinderella was first covered by the Swedish girl group Play. Play was formed in 2000 and originally consisted of four tween girls in Faye, Anna, Rosie, and Anais. Play was popular at their height and their music was regularly featured on Disney Channel. Us Against the World was probably their biggest song and it was featured both in Lizzie McGuire and Holiday in the Sun, an Olsen Twins movie. Play opened for some popular acts at the time like Destiny's Child and Aaron Carter. Cinderella was included on Play's first album, Us Against the World, which was released in 2001. The song was released as a single in the United States in 2002. Play recorded a video for Cinderella, which shows them performing the song live and some other behind the scenes footage. Some who are aware of this version of Cinderella actually say they like it more than the Cheetah Girls version. The song that Cheetah Girls is mainly known for that people put on the internet, Cinderella. Yeah. Sing, sing was a little not, bit that we don't have to. Okay. I don't want to be like you guys know. I don't want to be like Cinderella. <laughs> I can't do that. Was originally not the Cheetah Girls song. Whose song well, was it? It was originally a girl group named Play. Play stayed together until 2005, though Faye, the group's lead singer, left in 2003 and was replaced. In 2009, Faye and Anais reunited and added two new members to Play, and they lasted until 2011. Cinderella was also covered by the Taiwanese girl group She. She formed in 2001 and are one of the most popular Mando pop or Mandarin pop groups of all time. In English, their cover is titled Half Sugarism. I'm not exactly sure if this is a cover or just a separate song that samples Cinderella. The English translations of the lyrics don't match the English lyrics much, even accounting for differences in translation. But still, the song sounds the exact same way as the original Cinderella, including the more distinctive parts like the bridge. Cinderella was included on She's 2003 album Superstar, which came out just a week after the Cheetah Girls movie premiered on Disney Channel. In 2004, Thai singer Tata Young covered Cinderella for her 2004 album I Believe. The album was Tata's English debut and was a hit across Asia. Cinderella was also included on Kids Bop 5, which also came out in 2004, alongside covers of hits like Hey Ya, Crazy in Love, and Me Against the Music. Cinderella changed a lot of hands in the early 2000s, but I get it because it's a good song with a good message and the fairy tale metaphor is relatable to a lot of young girls. Honestly, that's probably a reason that Disney wanted the Cheetah Girls to record it. One thing I do find interesting is that out of all the artists who covered this song, none of them changed their production at all and instead used the same music as i5's original. I can see why though, because it's quintessential early 2000s pop and it sounds almost rebellious and defiant like the song's lyrics. The Cheetah Girls weren't the only Disney act to popularize a song with their cover. In 2006, the Jonas Brothers released their single Year 3000 from their debut album, It's About Time. Year 3000 was the band's first top 40 hit as it eventually peaked at number 31 on the Hot 100. 
The music video was regularly shown on Disney as it was one of the Jonas Brothers' earliest releases under Disney's label, Hollywood Records. All of the song's suggestive lyrics were changed for the Jonas Brothers' cover on account of their young fan base. In addition, some of the lyrics were changed to mention more contemporary artists, for example, changing a reference to Michael Jackson to Kelly Clarkson. The production is nearly identical to the original, save for some changes of the futuristic beeping sounds at the beginning, but those are present in the original as well. Year 3000 was originally recorded by Busted, a British pop rock band. The song was on their self-titled debut album, which was released in 2002. Year 3000 was inspired by Back to the Future, hence the references to futuristic technology like a flux capacitor. The song was the hit in Europe and went number two on the UK singles chart. Matt Willis, a member of Busted, said about the cover, Dude, they paid my mortgage for four years. I'm stoked to bits. Thank you very much, Jonas Brothers. James Bourne, another member, said he didn't like the cover at first and didn't like that the Jonas Brothers changed some of the lyrics. But the original song was eventually used on The Simpsons, and Bourne admitted the Jonas Brothers probably helped that happen, so in the end, he was grateful. Year 3000 was actually the song that inspired the Jonas Brothers to reunite in 2019. A group of college boys who were kids when the song first came out tweeted saying they would love to hear the year 3000 live again. Nick said those tweets made him and his brothers realize they'd lost touch with the fun-loving side of themselves, which songs like Year 3000 brought out of them. In March of 2019, the Jonas Brothers ended their hiatus with their song Sucker, the first single in six years. Just a couple months later in June, the Jonas Brothers performed Year 3000 with Busted at the Capitol Summertime Ball. Nick said he was open to collaborating with Busted in the future, especially since the Jonas Brothers have covered other songs of theirs in the past, like What I Go to School For. In 2013, Ellie Goulding released House Ion Days, a reissue of her sophomore album House Ion. On it, she included two deluxe tracks, one of which was Tessellate. It sounds sleek and smooth and almost sounds the way that Liquid feels. The production on Tessellate is stripped back, letting Ellie's vocals do most of the work. She adds a break for a brass solo in the middle of the song that almost works as an intermission. It's a slower song and feels like Ellie is singing the lyrics as they come to her with no rush. The production of her version is more electronic and futuristic, and she sounds a lot sultrier compared to the original. Tessellate was originally sung by British indie band All J. The single was included on their 2012 debut album, An Awesome Wave. The production on Alt J's Tessellate is more ornate, starting with the piano reminiscent of a clock striking. Drums are present throughout the song, but absent in the moments that Joe Newman, the lead singer, says, Till morning comes, let's tessellate. I'm sure this is a reference to tessellations, a pattern in which shapes fit perfectly together without any spaces. In terms of the song, tessellating likely means fitting bodies together, referencing physical intimacy. Tessellate makes other geometric references, such as the recurring line, triangles are my favorite shape, three points where two lines meet. The cover works well on Ellie, and she and Newman both have pretty unique voices. Newman sounds more heartbroken and longing than Ellie does, who sounds enticing yet aloof. The band is a fan of Ellie's version and her less cynical interpretation of Tessellate. Keyboardist Gus Unger Hamilton said about Ellie's cover, Well, Ellie's a fan of the band, and that's really nice, and she emailed me, sent me a message on Facebook or something just saying, Oh, I've done a cover of Tessellate. What do you think of it? I played it for everyone else and I thought it was really cool. Ultimately, it was nice of her to, in a sense, ask permission. She could have just done it and it would have been fine. He also commented on Ellie's video for Tessellate, saying it had a similar raunchy essence to the band's video, which references Raphael's 16th century fresco, The School of Athens. Like Ellie's cover, her video is more minimalistic and depicts a night in Paris. On the re-release of her debut album, Lights, Ellie covered Elton John's 1970 classic, Your Song. The love song was included on Elton John's second album. The song's writer, Bernie Taupin, didn't put any gender pronouns in the song because Elton wasn't openly out yet. Ellie's cover switches the order of the verses and removes the third verse entirely. The piano is more apparent in her cover as it's nearly the only instrument used. But like the original, there are noticeable strings in the song. Ellie adds harmonies to the bridge in her version, adding to the angelic sound of the song as it builds up toward the end. Fun fact, Prince William and Princess Catherine shared their first dance to this song as Ellie performed it at their wedding reception. Lady Gaga covered Your Song in 2018 and received praise from Elton John. Gaga recorded Your Song for Revamp, an album that reimagines the songs of Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Revamp included covers from artists like Pink, Ed Sheeran, Florence and the Machine, Mary J. Blige, and Demi Lovato. Lord included Swingin' Party on Pure Heroin, her highly anticipated debut album. She initially released the song in 2013 as a B-side to her single Tennis Court. 
Swingin' party is lonely and sorrowful, with Lord's voice ducking in and out of a spinning beat that sounds like an incessant loop. Lord's version is far more subdued than the original, which was recorded by The Replacements. Swing and Party was originally an alternative rock ballad written by Paul Westerberg, the band's lead singer, and included on their 1985 album, Tim. Westerberg said about the song, One of the reasons we used to drink so much is that it was scary going up on stage. That's one of the things Swing and Party is all about on the album, how it is a little frightening to put yourself on display all the time. The chorus ends with the line, If being afraid is a crime, we hang side by side at the swinging party down the line. It isn't wrong to be fearful from time to time, and if it is, then it's something everyone is guilty of. A review for the LA Times said Swingin' Party was about youthful insecurity. Youth and insecurity, and sometimes the lack of it, were common themes in Lord's music. The lyrics in Swingin' Party combine well with lyrics of literal partying in several of Lord's songs, and it almost masks the darker references in Swingin' Party. Still, Lord's moody rendition matches the jaded tone of several of her other songs. The unabashed tone of Westerberg's lyrics perfectly fits Lord's image as a more down-to-earth and insightful teen than that of her peers. Make no mistake, the original version isn't a happy song either, but Lord's version is more somber and reflective and almost regretful than the replacement's version, who sound almost resigned and accepting. Both versions capture sadness, but in two different ways. The same year, Lord also covered Tears for Fears' Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Her version was much slower, dramatic, and theatrical, and was made for the soundtrack for The Hunger Games Catching Fire. The song has obvious themes of power, corruption, and futility. But while Tears for Fear sings their version with almost an aw shucks tone over the bouncing pop sound of the 80s, Lord almost grumbles the lyrics, and the production transports you to the ruins of a city. Lord's version is also shorter and doesn't include the song's final verse. In 2016, Rihanna released Anti, an album many consider her magnum opus. One of the songs on Anti's Same Old Mistakes, in which, as the title suggests, Rihanna sings about mistakes from the past and trying to leave them behind. Rihanna kept the same production as the original song, and her vocals are layered in such a way that they continuously echo, making them sound almost hypnotic. When Rihanna heard the original song, which she loved, she had Rock Nation reach out so she could cover the song for Anti. It seems a lot of fans weren't as impressed with Rihanna's version since few changes were made. That's not to say people disliked Same Old Mistakes, but more to say that they wished Rihanna had made it her own a little more. I also saw someone say that Rihanna keeping the arrangement basically the same was a testament to the original rather than an uninspired move. The original version, called New Person, Same Old Mistakes, was released by Tame Impala in 2015. The song was included on the album Currents, which is primarily psychedelic pop, synth pop, and R&B. The entirety of Currents has the same disorienting, hazy feel as New Person's Same Old Mistakes. You can actually hear Kevin Parker's vocals from the original and parts of Rihanna's cover. Parker writes, produces, and records all of Tame Impala's music. People often mistakenly think Tame Impala is a band, but Parker is only joined by others on tour. He said that he's a fan of Rihanna's cover of New Person's Same Old Mistakes, and her take on the song was pretty much what he'd always imagined for it. He said, it seems so way out that Rihanna was going to use the song on her album. Funnily enough, I kind of imagined the song to be an R&B singer song in the first place. That's how a lot of Tame Impala songs start out, as ideas for songs I could potentially give to someone else. I think of them with a different persona in mind. It's just a subconscious way of not being bound by what you think you are as an artist. Parker said when he initially came up with New Person, Same Old Mistakes, it reminded him of TLC, so hearing Rihanna's version made him feel like the song was finally done right with the R&B spin on it. In 2018, Ariana Grande released Sweetener, her fourth studio album. On it was Goodnight and Go, a prose-like love song about the mundane yet exciting parts of a relationship. Ariana's version contains her signature airy vocals over a trap-laced EDM beat. The rework on the production was handled by Tommy Brown, who's one of Ariana's regular producers, as well as Charles Anderson and Michael Foster. They, along with Ariana and Victoria Monet, added two extra verses to the beginning of the song. In addition, they cut out the second verse from the original. Ariana has referred to her version of Goodnight and Go as both a remix and a cover, and said the original is one of her favorite songs, as she's a huge fan of Imogen Heap. Imogen Heap's Goodnight and Go was released in 2005 on her album Speak for Yourself. This is the same album that contains Hide and Seek. A bit of a stir was caused when it was noticed Imogen didn't initially have a writing credit on Ariana's cover. This was fixed about a couple weeks after Sweetener's release. Imogen has said that Ariana asked her for permission to make the song before it was even released, so she didn't know it was coming out. 
She and Ariana have actually met on several occasions, including Ariana's 21st birthday, for which she and her mom had dinner at Imogen's home in London. Imogen said about Ariana's cover, Her brother Frankie Grande sent me a text with the song, and I heard it and thought it was really great. I loved it. I'm so happy I'm smiling now. It feels like a gift. When somebody that famous picks up on a song that has had its day and gives it a second life, it's a real gift. I think she's done a lovely version of it. I love that saucy verse she's put in there and twisted it up at the end. What's not to like? Not to get too gross about money, but it's huge for me to have one track on a big album. One song on her album is like 10 of my albums, so it's pretty cool. It's like a gift. Lana Del Rey included a cover of Doing Time on Norman Effing Rockwell, her sixth studio album. Her cover has a sort of femme fatale vibe, confirmed by the amount of edits that use the evil we've come to tell you that she's evil most definitely part of the bridge. The music video references the 1958 film Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. A giant Lana traipses through Los Angeles, treating the city as her playground. The shot cuts away to show Lana watching herself at a 50s-style drive-in. She catches her boyfriend cheating, and giant Lana steps out of the film to pick up the boy's car and confront him, and then shares a knowing look with herself before retreating back into the film. Lana's doing time as a cover of Sublime's version, which was released in 1996. She decided to cover the song because her label Interscope was doing a Sublime documentary and she was a big fan of the band. Conveniently, Interscope owns Sublime's catalog. When Lana realized the cover would fit the aesthetic of Norman Effing Rockwell, she decided to include it on her album. Sublime's Do In Time opens with what sounds like elevator music and it samples a bossa nova cover of the original song, which I'll explain more later. Sublime comes in through static, making the song almost sound like it's playing through a radio or an old TV. Their version is faster paced than Lana's and has more obvious hip hop elements like the record scratches and the rapping in the background vocals. Do In Time is about a man who feels trapped in his relationship due to constant cheating. Sublime's version is definitely from the male partner's perspective and expresses his frustration and exhaustion. In Lana's version, it sounds like she's referring to someone else in parts of the song rather than solely singing about her own feelings. In other parts, it almost sounds like she's sympathizing with the girl who cheated or at the very least can understand it. The original version of Doing Time has a lot more elements in it, like riffs, ad-libs, screams, and dogs barking. It truly sounds like being outside during summertime. Both Lana and Sublime's versions of Due in Time derive from the 1935 folk opera Porgy and Bess. The opera was composed by George Gershwin and is adapted from a 1930s play, which was adapted from the 1925 novel Porgy. A summary of the 1930s play reads, Set in the 1930s in an African-American Charleston's neighborhood known as Catfish Row, Porgy and Bess centers on the tragic love story of the crippled beggar Porgy and beautiful Bess, who longs to turn away from her former life as a prostitute and addict. The stage versions of Porgy and Bess open with Summertime, which was originally an aria. Several of the musical elements have been interpolated in covers over the decades, so Lana's version is still reminiscent of the original in many ways, though they're separated by nearly a century. Summertime has different lyrics than Doing Time. Summertime does have the summertime and the living's easy at the beginning of each chorus. But this song has a more aspirational tone and is sung as a lullaby about better days coming. Originally, Sublime's version started off doing time and the living's easy, but they were forced to change it to summertime in order to release the song with the sample. However, Bradley Noel, Sublime's lead singer, had recently died of an overdose, so the band's friend and producer recorded the word summertime instead. Both versions of doing time have a jazzy feel to them that's underlying despite the other genres infused to the songs. That's likely because summertime became a jazz standard and several popular covers of it were done by jazz artists such as Billie Holiday. Billy's 1936 version was the first time Summertime hit the charts. Sam Cooke covered the song in 1957, as did Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong. Gospel singer Mahalia Jackson covered Summertime in 1958, combining the song with the spiritual Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Summertime itself was written to sound like a spiritual. In 1959, Porgy and Bess was made into a film starring Dorothy Dandridge and Sidney Poitier. Diane Carroll, Pearl Bailey, and Sammy Davis Jr. were also in the film. Summertime has also been covered by Miles Davis, who recorded an instrumental version for his 1959 album, Porgy and Bess. British band The Zombies did a rock cover of Summertime in 1965 and included it on their self-titled EP. The band was part of the wave of popularity of British music and fashion in the States known as the British Invasion. Summertime was also included on The Zombies' debut album and was one of the songs that helped them rise to popularity. The Beatles also covered Summertime, and Paul McCartney recorded a solo version in 1987. 
Summertime is thought to be the most covered song in history with over 67,000 known covers as of June of 2017. However, this number is disputed considering several of the covers were never recorded. Summertime has also been recorded by artists including Olivia Newton-John, Paul Robeson, and Janis Joplin. In 2015, Lana covered Nina Simone's Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood and included it on her fourth album, Honeymoon. Nina Simone recorded the first version of the song back in 1964. Lana trades out the piano for more somber synths, and her voice sounds both sad and smoky. Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood has been covered by several artists, including The Animals, John Legend, Mary J. Blige, and Brian Newman with Lady Gaga. On her album Ultraviolence, which was her album before Honeymoon, Lana covered The Other Woman, another one of Nina Simone's songs. It was written in 1956 and first recorded in 1959. Lana has said that she likes to sum up her albums with a cover of a jazz record. She's also done several other covers. On the reissue of her debut album, Born to Die the Paradise Edition, Lana covered Blue Velvet. The 1950 song was originally recorded by Tony Bennett, and a popular cover was released by Bobby Vinton in 1963. Lana's version of Blue Velvet was used in an H&M campaign. Lana has covered other artists, including Nirvana and Leonard Cohen, and even covered the Disney classic Once Upon a Dream for the 2014 film Maleficent. All right, so those are some songs that you perhaps didn't know were covers. Be sure to let me know which ones you already knew were covers and which ones you were surprised to find out were covers. And please, I know I'm saying this, but people will do it anyway. Don't be that person who's like, oh my God, I can't believe you didn't know that was a cover. People find things out at different times. I didn't even know that Good Night and Go was a cover until I just completely acted like Victoria Monet <laughs> wrote the entire song in the video I did on her and people corrected me. And I was like, oh, I found out she only wrote part of the song. So yeah, people learn things at different rates. It's totally fine. And like I said at the top of the video, covers are always fun because a lot of the times you do get to hear an artist interpret a song differently. And the great thing about covers is a lot of the times that's how you sometimes find a new artist that you would really like. I would not probably have known about Alt-J had I not been a fan of Ellie Goulding first and then liked Tessellate and found out it was a cover. And then I was like, oh, I like Alt-J's music. Also, let me know down in the comments if you prefer when an artist covers a song, if they kind of leave it pretty much the same as the original, or if you like what they do typically for BBC Live Lounge, for example, where they rework the song in a way that fits their style and their aesthetic. I think I lean towards liking those more just because I get to see something different about the song that I didn't, you know, get from the original artist, but everyone's different. Some people like the song to be more faithful to the original. As always, thank you all so very much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter if you'd like to keep up with me there. If you want to become a channel member, the link is in the description of this video. As always, love you dolls. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.